episode 238 of the Bevan James Iowa Show, How to Work on Hard Relationships. Radio team, welcome along to episode 238 of the Bevan James. I'll show your fortnightly podcast on the behaviours that create a lifetime love of exercise so you can get all the benefits that come alongside it. Oh man, where do I start with today? Well, I, one thing I do have to say is today's show, I'm going to be talking about working on hard relationships. Um, it's interesting, when I think about health, you know, we think about health and fitness, obviously movement and obviously some of those fundamental things like you know rest and recovery good nutrition uh, stress management are massive parts of being a healthy person but when we think about stress and we think about the causes of stress in life often one of the biggest causes of stress in life is relationships you struggle with in your life aren't they you know like you know if you've got that person at work who just annoys you if you've got that that boss You know, if if your relationship has problems, you know, that makes you unhealthy, doesn't it? In many ways, you know, there's many costs of how you deal with the stress of a bad relationship. It's the ownership of that. So today I thought, Amelia, you know, if you've been listening to my show recently, you know that I'm kind of 100% all about my book in my life right now. And I've got it coming out in about, well, the 4th of July. The 4th of July, if you listen to this in the future, this is in 2022. Uh, So I kind of... I'm kind of 110 my head just in this book getting it ready to you know so you guys can buy it but I did you know it's, I've been working with a couple of clients recently who've been who really have been struggling with some really hard relationships and so I thought it's a cool subject to do today because I do believe that having healthy relationships in your life is actually really important for your overall health so I'm going to dig deep into that later on today's show uh, before I do I just want to talk about I was just thinking about this I was, I was talking to someone the other day and I can't remember what we were talking about, but I was, I was having a session with a client actually. And when I'm having a session with clients, um, most of my clients are overseas, so I'm, I'm kind of on Zoom with them um, or Skype or something like that. And while we're chatting, I will also, you know, I'm taking notes and stuff. But this thought appeared in my head as I was having, I, was, I can't remember who I was talking to him and what we were talking about. But a thought appeared in my head, and I wrote it down on a piece of paper as I was kind of with my client. And the thought was, how far away are you from the dark side? How far away are you from the dark side? Now, I suppose the first thing to kind of acknowledge as we think about this is, what is the dark side to you? What is the dark side to you? So it might be a certain type of behavior. Let's go to the extreme. For the alcoholic, the the dark side is going back to alcohol if they've pulled away from alcohol. Um, for some people, it might be going down moral decisions that they know work against them some people might be putting themselves in environments where they know they're not going to like who they're going to be like i think deep down if i were to say to you what is your dark side you probably know what that is eh you probably know what that is and my know is my you know i've I've talked on the show many times my my dark side would probably be me walking away from fitness as my career which is which is an interesting thing, you know, like, you know, because ultimately my passion and my, my life's work is to help as many people move as possible. And my dark side would be me chasing money instead of chasing a passionate career. You know, and I'm not, even, not, not, I'm not chasing, I'm in a passionate career. So instead of me, it would be me chasing financial gains that had nothing to do with help, helping people instead of on this path that I'm currently on and I'm trying to go further down. That would be my dark side. You know, so when you kind of think about your dark side, then the next question is, is how close to it are you? And for sometimes in life, like, let's say let's say this book. Now, I want this book to be a total success, and I'm very lucky because I'm in a very good position in life where even if the book doesn't become a total success, it's not the end of my world, but I've put a lot of time and energy into it. Let's say the book was a total failure. I sold one copy. Like, I sold none, no copies of the book at all. Would that push me further to my dark side? How close am I to that dark side? Where I go, you know what, fitness is too hard. I'm going to go down another pathway. I'm going to go just, you know, do something where I can just make money. You know, now for me at this moment in my life, the dark side is quite far away. But for sometimes, for some people, where you are, if you can first of all identify where that dark side is for you, 
how close to it are you? And and then maybe you know if you're far away from it, like I feel I am right now, like I I can see myself doing fitness for for a while, you know, well, hopefully for the rest of my career. But um, if the dark side is quite far away for you, then that's good. But then if it's close to you. What do you do to create distance from that space? And, and probably just as I'm kind of talking about this right now, one thing for you to think about is what creates a space where you're moving closer to your dark side and what creates distance between that space? And if you could start to become aware of, like, like if you are in that place where you're thinking, you know, maybe well, we'll just do this thing right now, what, what creates that for you? And then also in those times when the idea of doing your dark side behavior or your dark side thing is well off in the distance, what creates that for you as well? Now, that's all I'm going to talk about with this today. I, I, I just kind of wrote down that thought and it just kind of popped in my head and I thought it's a really interesting way of thinking about things because I think deep down we all have that dark side thing. And again, it can be a certain behaviors, it can be certain ethical choices we can make, it can be Choices that are, you know, like like me chasing money career instead of doing a fitness career. You know, these different types of things. I, I just think it's a really interesting way to think about things. So a couple of questions to throw at you. What is your dark side? How close to you are you to the dark side right now? If you are close, what's creating that condition or what those conditions? And then how do you move away from those conditions? And then if you're well away from them, then why are you well away from them? And what do you need to maintain moving forward? Yeah, it's a random little start to the show today. I do want to give you a, just a quick update on the book. We are 99 point, I'm going to say 8, 99.8% finished on the main part of the project. The book's done. I've got the hard copy I talked about in the last couple of episodes. The main, the first big print runs coming through. We should be getting it in the next week or so. The website's 99.9% done. The audio book's just about finished. And we're going to get that to the, onto, you know, Audible and all those things over the next couple of weeks. Um, it's been a really, and maybe what I'll do is I might actually do a bit of a podcast once the book's come out on my journey to creating this book. Because one thing I think, you know, one thing I've been talking to, I've started doing some interviews that are promoting the book. So I did an interview with a, a good friend of mine called Will. Um, he's got a fitness podcast for fitness professionals, so he's going to release that podcast once the book comes out. But I did an interview with him yesterday, and I'm starting to do some of the, the, the promotion, which will be the next job of the book. And one thing that I, I talked about to Will was this whole idea of I'm in a very privileged place in my life where I get to be the guy who can devote my mind space, time and resource, and get others around me to support me on a project that I'm is really, let's just be honest, it's a total passion project. It's, 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 it's something I totally believe in and I want to help people and I want to get as many people moving as possible. And I'm in a position in life where I can take on that project and, and it's really cool. And so, um, A, I, I have the time and resource, so that's very lucky, but you still got to do the work. You know, and I have been saying to people recently that if I knew how much work this project was going to be, maybe I wouldn't have done it. Now, I don't know if that's true. I, I, I just think you've got me in this, you know, when I say this to people, it's just that like, to be honest, the last, well, it's pretty much the first six months this year, but particularly probably the last two months, it's just been full on, like full noise. I've just been like, any spare moment where I'm not doing my regular job, um, and my, you know, maintaining, looking after my healthy self is just going into me doing big projects on this book. And the thing about a book is there's, you know, we've done, A, we've written a book, B, I've had to get the production of that done, C, audio book, um, websites, we've created a course that goes to the book. So there's a lot of work that goes in place. Um, and it's a real, it's a real self-management journey. You know, it, there's this kind of self-management in regards to dealing with the people who are supporting you and, and creating the book and building good relationships and getting good work from them. Uh, there's the self, there's the self focus of yourself. So how do you manage yourself well through this this journey? And and there's kind of a few aspects around that. One of the aspects is looking at your project plan and knowing how that what's the most important part of the jigsaw puzzle I'm working on at this moment, and then working through that whole process. And I, and I think I might do a bit of a podcast once the book's out. Just to talk about that, because as much as uh, I really hope this book can help as many people love movement, and I believe I've I've done a pretty good job now. And rich speak, there probably will be things I will look upon and think oh, I could have done that better. But fundamentally, I think the base product's pretty close to where it needs to be. But it has been a real self journey. You know, like the, the, there's a lot of tools I've had to use to get to this point where you know, in three weeks from now, this book's going to be on the market. And I and you know, like it's. 
I, I, as I said before, I'm in the position where I can be the person who does a passion project in a really powerful way. Uh, but B, you've also got to be the person who does the work. And I, and I, I don't know, I just think that I've learned a lot about myself through this whole journey. Um, and also I've learned a lot of things that maybe I can share with you that if you are, have you got that project in your head that you think, man, oh, I really want to be able to do this project in my life, but but nothing really ever happens. And I, and I suppose when I when I think of myself and being proud of myself, is if, if I have anything in life, it's my ability to apply and do the things I say I'm going to do. You know, like, I, I you know, two years ago I said I'm going to write this book and, and three weeks from now it's coming out you know and and it's one thing to say I'm going to do something but also what's the process and so maybe what I will do is once the book comes out I'll, I'll just do how I approached a big project like this what was my strategies and what got me to the point where it is today so maybe there's something in there for you but anyway the book is going to be coming out on the 4th of July as I said in the last episode if you can support me with this book that'd be really really amazing and and there's a few ways you'll buy, buy the book obviously spread the word about the book put it on your socials and so on anyway before we get into the main just the show I want to say thank you to the patrons of the show these are the people who give some of their hard earned money every time I release one of these episodes and when you become a patron you get a cool nickname now if you have thought about being a patron and you haven't I do encourage it obviously it just helps me do what I do uh, and some of the patrons are Jen Pillipo she's the mind feeder we've got Martin the assassin Kelly we've got Adesia and that's the cool name <laughs> there you go Adam Lionheart Philby and Jared Cool Calm Collected uh, Becker there we go he's a He's a local fitness instructor in Monaco area, actually. Jared, he's a, he's a good young man. Anyway, let's go into the main gist of the show where I'm going to talk about working on hard relationships. In some ways, I'm not the best person to talk about this subject. And, and the reason I say that, and, and to be honest, I'm not, this isn't a subject I'm an absolute expert in, um, but I have been working with some people recently which we've been getting some really good progress and so I thought I'd share that with you but but why am I not a very good person to talk about the subject well I've created a life where I don't really have any difficult relationships um uh I don't you know I don't have work colleagues who I really struggle with because I kind of don't really work with many other people like I work at a gym where I I I share teaching with other people but it's you're very kind of autonomous in your role and the place I work at's got great work colleagues so it makes it very easy um I work for my, I've got my own business so and our staff the we have contractors who coach for us um great people we've got a really great team of people around us there's no real difficult people who we work with um my friendships are I'm, I'm very lucky in life that I've got some really great friends and I don't really have that friend who I really struggle with so you know, in my own life, in my own personal experience of me living in this world, it's not a it's not a thing that I have a lot of struggle with. Now, I've got to be honest; it's kind of something I've created. Uh, I've kind of created a life where I tend to only have good relationships in it. Um, yeah, so that's, that's you know, that's that's my thing. So in some some ways, I'm you know, I haven't got a lot of experience personally. And having to work through really hard relationships. But in saying that, as much as my lived experience doesn't have a huge amount of that, it doesn't mean that a lot of people are having the similar experience to me. And I actually think for a lot of people, one of their biggest stresses in life is other people in their life. And when we think about other people in their life, and I suppose the first thing we want to think about is, who are the people who bring the tension that I think we all know we're talking about here today. That tension of, and, and you know, like, so, so people who frustrate you, people who you think are unfair with you, people who, the best way I like to think about it is people who own you. And I remember years ago, and this is a good example of this, and this is, a, my mother had a lady who worked with her, and my mother really struggled with this lady. And they, like, they worked in an office with like five people, kind of all in this office space. And I think my mum was the manager and this lady worked under her. But this lady was, I don't actually know the problem I had, my mum had with her. But my mum had a lot of problems with her. And the thing about it was, when you hung out with my mother, she would talk about this lady all the time. And when she talked about this lady, she talked about her in a way where you actually... 
frowned upon my mother a little bit. Like my mother became an ugly person when she talked about this person because the way she talked about this person was quite horrible. And I wonder I actually pulled up my mum and I said, Mum, I've got to be honest, you sound ugly in this situation. Like I get that you that this person really kind of rubs you the wrong way, but ultimately the way you speak about it it's a bit horrible and I just kind of pulled my mum up just because you know that's what you should do I think is you know when, when people are maybe letting themselves down you need to pull them up and, and she kind of acknowledged and said thanks and, and kind of moved away from that behaviour but the thing about it was this person in my mother's life owned her like when I like when I think about the interaction my mother had with other people often she would speak about this lady also when my mother was like I don't, I, I don't know my mum's internal experience, but I imagine inside my mum's head, my mum was owned by this lady. Like if we just do that think of thing of how many hours of thinking space do you have in a week? I imagine that lady owned a lot of my mum's thinking space, and this is often what happens when we think about the relationships in our life that are really hard, is that they end up owning us in ways that are really unhealthy for us. And there's many ways we can look at this. We can even just look at this through mental fatigue. You know, like if, if, you're, if you're annoyed by somebody and are owning your mental space, that is draining your mental energy. It's draining your mental energy. And so then when you get to the end of the day and you meet to go out and do some exercise, and let's be honest, exercise is something that takes a little bit of mental energy, then you're like, oh, can I be bothered today? So then you don't do your exercise. And then you feel crap about yourself, so then you have some bad food. So on and so on. And that's why I wanted to do this subject today, because this is called the Fitness Behaviour Podcast. And, and let's be honest, this podcast goes all over the place. It's kind of just whatever I want to talk about this week. But, but with that in mind, dealing with hard relationships is a massive thing that we need to get better at if you're somebody who has those relationships in your life. Now, as I said earlier, I'm kind of lucky because I've got a life where I don't have many, well, at the moment I don't have any, I'm sure at times I do, but generally speaking, I don't really have those types of relationships in my life. But if you're listening to this right now and you know you have that person, this is a, this should be an area of working on in your life. And it's actually interesting, I was, I was interesting, a few weeks ago, I was at a party and somebody I know got drunk and they got drunk in a way which I've never seen them like before they got became quite a vicious drunk quite quite mean and quite um just a little bit horrible I've got to be honest just just a bit you know just mean and and this person is not that person like it was really bizarre because I know this person really well and generally speaking they're really lovely people and good presence and good energy and and it was really bizarre and and they were drunker than I'd seen them ever before. So, you know, they obviously got to a higher level of drunkness. But it was also quite revealing that they needed to work on themselves. You know, and so as a friend, and I actually haven't had this conversation yet, but I will pull them pull them aside and say, hey, mate, what's up? Um, and, you know, here's because often people don't know what they're like. They forget what they're like. And a lot, a lot of people don't want to bring it up. So I will because I'm, I'm, I think, being a good friend means you have the hard conversations. And so um, and I'll just say, you know, is there some stuff that maybe you haven't worked on that you need to work on. Because the stuff they were bringing up was quite revealing around an area of their life that they needed to work on. And this person, some of their energy in their life needs to go on working in this area. And often when it comes to the hard relationships in our life, those relationships that own us and that, you know, are really consuming in really negative ways and can have this massive cost, you know, like as if I just say the owning, what's, what's, the, what's the cost other than that, you know, the cost both internally and externally. What, what's that cost on your life? And what's the cost long term? Like if you work with someone for five years who has just rubbed you up the wrong way every day, what's the cost on your life for that? And like my friend, the thing about my friend who was drunk the other week is the stuff that it was quite obvious for everyone around that they needed to work on is stuff that I know they probably need to work on for a long time. And so one thing I'm going to talk to my friend about is, hey, it, it seems pretty clear that some stuff you need to work on, and, and maybe you know to get some someone to guide you through how to work on that stuff. It might be some counselling or whatever. It might be you know investing in some someone who can help you work through some of the bigger things that maybe you're pushing aside, which you need to be worked on. Now, this is an obvious one because it's an area it was kind of clear, but often the relationship thing is really hard because you're 
dealing with somebody else. And if it's somebody who's rubbing you up the wrong way, or is creating that tension in your life, you probably haven't got the greatest relationship with them. So there can be this really big hurdle for you to overcome. So with this in mind, this is what I really wanted you to work or, or talk about today, is how do you actually work on, on the hard relationship? How do you actually work on the the hard relationship and I'm going to share a few examples of some people I've been working with and and there are hopefully some really good insight for you here and, I, and I, I'm going to break this down to a few steps and I think the first step I'm going to say is what's the easiest way to do it well the easiest way to do it is to remove them from your life and sometimes you can do that like I have I remember years ago I had this lady in my life who was in some ways the coolest person but in some ways the biggest bully ever and she's the she was the kind of person who was so much fun, but it always came at someone else's expense. She was she was, she was kind of like the bully in the group, and everyone would laugh as long as she wasn't putting her energy on you. And I, I actually, you know, I really enjoyed her company, except that aspect of her. And the problem with to me, the problem, the difference between uh, to me that the bully is like we all give each other shit, like. You know, when I think of my friends, I give my friends shit. I, you know, I give them, you know, the, the ribbing. But you give them ribbing in areas where, you know, they're pretty secure. You know, so you might you might give them, you know, make some fun out of them. But but it's in an area where you know they're competent, you know they're secure. It's, 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 it's you know, it's, you're not hurting their feelings. Whereas the bully will know the insecure side of you and they'll point that out to everyone around you and make you feel small for that and that's what this person was and it was a person who I fundamentally really liked but it was just this one part of them I didn't like and I just determined in my life and I did actually bring it up to her but nothing really changed and so in my life I just determined you know what this is the kind of person I don't need in my life and and I do think in some ways the easiest way to remove people from your life that are hard relationships is just to get rid of them now some people are going to say but what if it's your family and sometimes it's the right thing as well I, I remember years ago I was working with a lady talking about owning someone I, I was working with this lady who her mother was just a horrible person and there are horrible people out there you know it's, it's unfortunate but her mother was horrible and her mother was elderly so her mother was probably I don't know let's say she was in her 80s I can't remember this was a long time ago um, and her mother was and been horrible to her daughter the whole life. And, and you know, horrible comments, horrible disapproval, horrible, you know, just, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, and the daughter felt a loyalty because it was blood. And I get it. But ultimately, it was just it was just damaging the daughter's life. And, and so we did a trial, a period of time where we said, okay, well, let's just see if you pulled away for a period of time, what would your life be different like? if you didn't have to deal with that relationship. And it was, you know, it was a hundred times better. And she did maintain a relationship with her mother after the fact, but it was a lot different because there's way different boundaries. There's a lot less. And she also had some rules and criteria that she had around. So like if her mother ever said something mean to her, that was the end of the conversation. She was gone. So it'd be like if she was on the phone, her mother says, I mean, okay, I've got to go now. And that's the end. And she'd even tell her mother, look, because you've said this, I can't deal with you anymore. Or if, if she was with her, she'd kind of just pretty much wrap up things and leave. And so she protected herself really well around her mother. She listened the interactions a lot. And she was in a much healthier space for that reason. So I get when there's blood involved, it's, it can be difficult. Um, but I also... You know, it's easy for me to say, as, as, a, as a guy on a podcast who, you know, doesn't live your life, to say, well, just remove these people from your life. Now, sometimes you can't do that. You know, if you've got a career and you've got someone in your career who's just, you know, you, you love your career, everything about your job except for this person, sometimes you can't do that. So the next thing to say is, if you're in a situation where you can't remove the person, and again, it's probably the easiest way to do it, is... You've got to do some work, and it's going to be hard. It's it's going to be hard. But if this person's going to be a presence in your life, if you do the work, you can make it better. And I and I've got two real examples that I'm thinking of right now. So uh, I had a guy oh, a few years ago now, and he was kind of like a CEO kind of level guy. He was, um, yeah, he was he was a CEO level guy in the over in the UK, and he was 
He was working for a business which the founder was still involved in. And this is going to be quite difficult when you're a CEO, when you're working under a founder. Because the founder, while the founder steps away from the big role of this, this you know, it's quite a big business, um, the founder still has a big influence. You know, it's not like the founder's gone, he's just a token thing on the side. It, you know, and, and this CEO felt there was a total frustration. This founder... He just, you know, the CEO was doing something he was really passionate about. He loved the industry he's in. He was, felt he was, you know, had the chance to have massive impact. And then he had this this relationship, which was there's probably a bit of high power dynamic in there as well. And uh, the CEO really struggled with this, and it was getting to the point where the CEO wanted to maybe think about moving away from the job. And this is a real problem because he, other than the founder. There was a perfect situation in his life. And so we, we sat down and we, we, we basically said, well, you need to work on this. You need to work on your relationship with the founder. And he felt resistance when I said that. But it was kind of like, well, what's the cost if you don't work on it? What's the cost? And, and, and ultimately he said, well, the cost is if I don't work on it, I'm going to get to a place where I end up leaving a job, which fundamentally I love. Like it's the right industry, it's the right level, I'm, I feel I can have a big impact, I've, you know, so on and so on. So fundamentally the cost was going to be that he was going to move away from something he loved. Also, it was hurting the work that he was doing in his current position because because he was so consumed by the CEO, go back to that mind space, he wasn't doing the best work that he could do. So for him to, get be, to either stay in the world or, or get to a healthier place within the world, he had to work on the relationship. And I actually have another example I'm working on right now. I've, I've got someone who works in kind of, who's a manager, a high level manager, and got a 2IC, which is um, kind of like the next level manager down, but they kind of work together a lot. But their relationship is real, there's a real fraction in their relationship. There's, you know, the, the relationship is really difficult because. The person I'm working with just feels that the, the person who's slightly under them is just undermines them and doesn't trust them. So all their interactions, and, and probably the person who's working under them probably feels there's a problem you know, as well. I don't know because I haven't spoken to the other person. But there's this real tension between these two people, which they're trying to do big projects in really big ways, but they're almost like they're working against each other in ways that isn't working. So in both of these examples, the CEO and this high-level manager, we've been working on, with the CEO, we've, we've actually done it, but with this high-level manager I'm working right now on it, is we've got to work on the relationship. Now the first point, and this is, if you're someone who's got that relationship in your life, you're, going, you're probably going to feel resistance as I say this, is you've got to determine that you're going to do the work, and that the work is probably going to be hard. You've got to determine that you're going to do the work. Because again, if you don't do the work, what's going to be the cost? CEO is going to leave his job, he's not doing the greatest work he could do, his best use of energy, this latest manager, similar thing, he's just being owned by this person. So with both of these people, we talked about you need to do some work. And the first piece of the puzzle is you have to go to the person you need to work with and say, we've got some things we need to develop in our, our ability to be a better relationship together. I'm going to say again because it's really important. We've got things that together we need to work on so we can make our relationship a better relationship. Now, I'm going to be honest, in these types of moments, it's we're not trying to say that you're going to end up being best buddies. You know, it's that's, that's not the goal. It's just that you have a, a, a relationship which means you can work really well together in whatever you're trying to work on. Um, now, obviously, I'm talking about workplace environments right now, but it can be... You know, like things like the people you struggle with in your life. And you can let them know, there's aspects of this relationship I really struggle with. How can we get better at this? And the CEO one was a really good one. Actually, and I want to share both of those ones. Because the manager is kind of in this moment right now. And we had a session a few weeks ago. And we and I said, okay, well, you know, let's be honest. What's the cost? And, and, and this manager starting to think about trying to find other jobs. And this manager's, you know, it's kind of similar to the CEO. And I said, is it, you know, do you, do you want to leave your job? And I, no, I love my job. Well, so so you're willing to leave your job, you're willing to screw up your whole life because you're not willing to work on a hard relationship. And you could see as I said this to them, they're like, oh man, Bevan, you're pain in the butt. Um, and so I, their homework, and what I do when I have sessions with people, I kind of give them homework to work on, and it was to have a conversation with this person around opening up to doing some work on, on how their relationship works. Now, 
this my manager, the, the manager, I'm gonna say manager or CEO, just so you guys know. The manager did amazing. They went home, they they did some really good thinking about how to approach the conversation. They actually did some role playing with their partner. So did some role playing around, okay, what am I gonna do? And they had the conversation. They had the conversation with the person, the kind of two IC person, and said, look. We both know that this relationship creates tension for both of us. I, I don't want that to be the case. We both have things we need to work on in this. We need to make some change. And that was that was the first point of call. Now, if you're listening to this right now, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to with the person in your life, especially like if you haven't, if you've got, if you're like me and you're like, no, nah, I'm sweet as well. This probably isn't the podcast for you today. But if you are that person who's got people in your life. And you know, you might even just think of that one person who's who's owning you, like my mother, you know, that person who at work. Are you willing to do that work? And I know as I said, it's not gonna be easy. But willing to sit down and say, actually, I I, I need to I, I need to have a conversation with you around how we can work better together. Now, if I go back to my CEO example, so my CEO example, we actually did the same thing. So I said, look. You've got to work on your, on your founder. You know, you've got to work on your relationship with your founder because A, it's pushing you away from a job you love. B, you don't feel he's doing you good work. And C, the th- and the thing of this, the CEO, he actually respected the founder. The founder was a genius. He said the founder is a great thinker. He's, he's a genius, but he just undermines me in lots of ways that hurts my my role. And so, you know, the first point of call with the CEO was to to have the conversation my managers had. To, hey, we need to work on how this relationship works. Now. That's again, it's hard to do, but the CEO did it. But what the CEO did wrong, and this is going to lead to my second point, is they had the conversation and they were good for a couple of weeks. You know, they had the conversation, and then for the next couple of weeks, him and the founder, it went really well. And then, you know, then the next CEO session with me, he was like, that went really well, great. And then we kind of went on to the next thing they were working on. And then three or four months later, the CEO is like, oh, you're not going to believe I'm the founder's doing this, this, and that again. And what had happened was they had a, a moment of honesty which gave them a moment of focusing on getting better and then they slowly slipped back to old habits. And let's be honest, we've all experienced that. Like if you're in a romantic relationship, you know, we've all had those moments where we're like, oh man, we've got to sharpen up and let's do this to make sure we sharpen up. And then for the next couple of days, you sharpen up and then it slowly creeps back to that old version of how you did things. So with that in mind, and actually going back to my manager, so my manager did that point well, and what I learned from the CEO, so actually I'll go back to the CEO, so with the CEO, what I did next is, after a couple of months when he came back and he said, look, actually it's kind of going back to square one, I said, well, what we need you to do is we need you to have a commitment and a routine on working with the relationship with your founder. So it's not just every time it goes 10 steps back. It's actually, we're going to catch up every two weeks, have a 30-minute get-together on how we, our relationship works together. Like, we're, we're committing to an involvement process. We, you know, like, we're going to, every two weeks, no matter what, we're, we're, we're going to commit to this. And this was the turning point for the CEO and founder. Because once they did that, their relationship actually it became the point where the founder and the CEO, they didn't become good mates. It wasn't the point of it. But what they did is they created this amazing working relationship because the CEO was a genius. And, and I'm sorry, the founder was a genius. My CEO knew that. And he wanted the, the, CEO, the founder to bring the aspect that was amazing about him to him. But then he also needed to his own space and stuff with the CEO. And the CEO, the, the founder needed to learn, okay, well, here's how I can work better with this guy. And it's interesting, actually. I've been talking to someone recently about this because one of the biggest problems a lot of people have is defensiveness. Defensiveness is when you get feedback, you don't own it. You blame someone else or you just push back. So it's when someone might say, oh, you know, I noticed that when I was talking in my presentation today, you were talking and I found it disrespectful. And they go, oh, no, it's because someone else was talking to me. You know, or, um, I, I, you know, you always tend to be late when I'm doing something that's really important. Oh, no, that's because so-and-so and so-and-so. So defensiveness is that I'm not taking ownership of the thing that I should take ownership of. And going back to my CEO, um, 
he was the, the founder was defensive. Now, what happened was because they had this, they, they and they did well. They did really well because what they did is they, they these are high level people. You don't be a CEO or founder of a big business unless you're a high level person. Um, so they made the commitment. They made a commitment to every two weeks they catch up, and it was it was not what what's happening in the business is how's our relationship going. And the the founder was quite a defensive soul. And what the CEO learned was first of all. In the moment with the founder, and this was really fascinating, so what would happen was I would give my feedback on areas, you know, and they kind of, they, they developed, I can't remember exactly, but they developed a kind of series of questions they're going to work through. And they had to tell, you know, it was a bit of a dial up, dial down thing. So dial up, here's what you did well and how you would relate work, work well with me this week. And here's one thing that maybe you can think about. And he said at first, the founder was always really defensive in how he responded to his dial up. But then after the moment, the changes would start to happen. So even though in the moment the founder did not like, you know, he almost put the wall up, he did the feedback to get through. But as time went on, even the defensiveness went away. And this is a really interesting thing to, to know is that if we can commit to a process and we can both be open to developing this side of things, we can make massive progress. And so the first thing is you need to, to address it. And I'm going to be honest, it's going to be hard because it, it, it's, a, but probably a couple of things to think about this is it's not a confrontational moment. You're not going to them saying, you suck, you're terrible at my relationship, you need to sharpen up. And this is again, my manager did really well. They went home, they sat down and thought about what, what the approach was. So to me, the, the way you approach it's going to be really important. And it can just be a really honest, hey, let's be honest. I think both of us know that something about this relationship isn't working. And for us to both live in a better space and for us to both get more out of our relationship, it's worth us both working together to see how we can make it work better in a way where it's not getting angry at each other, but it's literally we can improve this thing. Like if you, let's say someone came up to you, let's say someone in your life who you knew you had tension with came up to you and said that, you'd probably be open to it, eh? Whereas if they came up and said, oh, you're so annoying you're always, and you always frustrate me and bam, bam, bang, well, you're going to put the gloves on. And so the first thing is, is what's the approach that you would have that would not make them get upset and would make them be open to developing the relationship? And once you've done that, then you, what you want to do is probably sit down with them and just say, what are we trying to work toward? And, and one thing I think is really important here is to try to get the base understanding. Because like if I think of my manager that I'm talking about, so the thing about them is both of them are looking for the same kind of outcomes in, in the thing that they're trying to do. But just the communication style is really bad between each other. So one thing is, is to understand that actually we both want the same thing here. You know, so that's a good foundation thing that we want to understand. So first of all is think about how you're going to approach the conversation. Then have the conversation in a way that opens them up to, to not think that they're bad or anything. So that both of you need to work on this. Second of all, third of all, start to create an understanding of where you both are coming from as you try to work towards this. So that you do get that understanding of, because sometimes people do make, like I remember, sometimes people do take actions which do upset you, but then you know deep down that they're coming from the right place. And sometimes it can make us a bit more accepting of the actions or we can see where it comes from a little bit more. So that's so so get a good understanding of where you're both coming from. Then the next step is to make a commitment to ongoing working on the relationship. And it was interesting because my manager who's just started this process, the first week they did it, the second week they did it again and the, the person said, oh, we're going to make this a regular thing and, and, and a little bit of a snarky way. And the manager said, yeah, yeah, because we need to work on this relationship. And then the next week the manager got sick and then the next week something happened majorly at work when they meant to catch up, which and it was a real fire, basically, if you know what I mean. And so they couldn't make it. And then we caught up recently and I said, well, you need to make sure this happens because you're going to lead the commitment to the process. And if you are the person who's going to initiate this, you've got to do that as well. You can't do that thing of, oh, yeah, it's a bit hard this week, I won't do it. Because then you're going to end up where my CEO was, which was three or four months later, you're just going to be back to square one. So if you're going to do the work of opening it up and having that first conversation, and then make a regular commitment to each other, but you're probably going to have to drive that commitment. So it might be the day before you send them an email saying, hey, but I look forward to catching up tomorrow for our thing. Or we send them a text in the morning, I look forward to catching you at so-and-so. Then together, 
creating some kind of process around how you can work better in your relationship together. Now, it might be that dial-up dial thing. It might be you've got to start with praise. It might be, um, I don't know, that, that's something you'll need to work on together. You know, that when we do catch up, how do we keep our focus on developing a better working relationship or a better relationship in this area? And I, I'm not going to give you lots of tools here today, but it might be that you read some books on better relationships. It might be that you create some more time to understanding each other. It might be that you have a kind of a series of questions that each time you catch up, you work through. It might be that you actually get a mentor who sits beside both of you as you work through. There's someone who's really skilled with relationships and just sits beside and says, hey, you know what? Here's what you did here. Here's what you did here. It's not a bad thing. Then ultimately what you want to do, and I'm always, I think I talked about this at the end of my last podcast, is that show an understanding at the end of each meetup. So it might be that the person said to you, they don't like the way that you email them at all hours of the day. And they feel that it digs into their boundaries because it means at night time when they're, um, or it might be text, you know, you text them all times a day, and at night time when they're trying to relax with their family, you're, you know, they feel they get pulled away from their family to have to do some work. So a good understanding statement at the end of the catch-up is to say, okay, so the thing I need to work on this week is I need to work on only texting you from the boundaries that we've determined because you want to feel that you can feel free to be with your family when you get home. And see what I've done there? I've just shown an understanding of what I'm trying to work on and why it's important to you. Now, this is a really good tool to put in place because what it does is it, you know, because I think one of the biggest problems in the world is poor communication means people don't actually understand each other. And so at the end of the of the feedback or the interaction is to kind of go back to each other saying, okay, here's what you're taking away. Here's what I learned. Here's what I see from your perspective and here's what I need to work on. And ultimately, then you've got to do the work. You know, then as you work through until you have your next meeting, you've got to do the things that you both agreed on. If it is not texting, it's even if even if you feel it's a really important thing, you've got to, no, no, boundary said, I won't do that, bam, bam, bam. Or um, you've got to praise them more if you said you've got to praise them, whatever it is. Now, do you think if you if you did a process like this in your hard relationship, that relationship we could improve? Now, again, I'm not saying it's going to be the most rock star relationship of all time, but do you think it could improve? And that's that's a really interesting thing to think about. Is I guarantee it can because I fundamentally most things can improve. Now, sometimes. There will, I'll admit, there will be the time it won't improve, and that's where maybe you will think about moving the job. There's maybe when you will move away from things, and maybe you know where your best thing is, is probably to remove them from your life, especially if they're owning you a lot and it's coming at a massive cost. But if you if you haven't given it a chance, and if you're like again, go back to the go back to the the CEO, the guy in London, he was he was willing to give up a, a job that was like his dream job. Like it was like his lifetime dream and he loved the job just because of this relationship that was really frustrating for him. And in the end, uh, uh, the job became a way better job because in the end, because he did the work and because he committed to it in the long term, he actually was got better at his job because his founder was a genius and he was able to use his founder in a way that was powerful. And his founder gave him, he had a lot more respect for him long term as well. So it was a win-win relationship. And this is the thing is that often people will do the the, the thing that comes at a bigger cost to their life, like moving away from a career, just because they don't want to do the, the hard thing in the moment. So if you do have a hard relationship in your life, again, the easiest way is to move away from it, but if it isn't, the first thing to do is to go, I'm going to confront working on the relationship and do some prep before that, understand what you need to, how you're going to address it, and then have the moment where you address it. Now, from there... Create an understanding with the other person that you want to work on it. Try to create an understanding of where you both come from. Then create a process that you'll work through each time you catch up with the core being that you're trying to get better at working on your relationship together. Then commit to it. And you may need to lead that. Like if it's one day where you go, oh, they text you, oh, are you sure you can do this today? Like, yeah, no, we need to do it today. You know, we need to do it today. It's that, I remember, I remember saying to my, my guy in a band, we're going to have, you know, my album's coming out sometime soon. Um, and I said, the real key to getting this album out is we've got to have momentum. So, that, you know, like, we never miss a session. We always turn up. 
Because if one of us misses a session, then someone's going to miss a session the next week. And if someone says, oh, can you be bothered tonight? You've got to go. And I, I've had times, like my Thursdays are a massive day. I'm up at 4.45. I, I teach classes. You know, from 4.45 through to 7 at night, I'm just all go. And we, we often practice on a Thursday night. And there's times I don't want to go. I'm tired. It's the end of my week. Friday's my day off. But I want to get momentum. So I turn up. And that's what you've got to do is you've got to keep momentum and building the foundation of what will improve the relationship. So where there's that moment where you go, oh, I could fall away from this right now. And I'll be honest, with my manager right now, they're a little bit there because they did it a couple of times. It was actually improving the relationship and then COVID happened, then a real fire did happen. And now it's been about three or four weeks since I've done it again. And it could be a thing of, oh, they will just fall away. And I, and I really kind of challenged and said, no, this, this week you make sure that happens and make sure it happens next week because... And the couple of times you did it, you saw improvements. What does it look like in a year from now if you keep doing that work? Relationships, hard relationships, come at a massive cost to our health. A massive cost. And if you want to be healthier as a person, sure, movement, sure, nutrition, sure, rest, sure, stress management. But actually, improving the relationships that come at the biggest cost to your life is one of the best things you can do. Now, it's going to take effort. It's going to be tough. Um, it, there'll be, be maybe a bit of a roller coaster at time, but I can pretty much guarantee if you can never get the waters well with that person, you will get to a better side in the long term, which means your health, your effectiveness, and what you can do with that person moving forward will be absolutely massive. So this is hit a note for you today. Make sure you do the work, and as always, what do I say? It will make you be a higher level version of yourself. Radio team, so that's this week's show. So that's this week's show, pretty much done and dusted. It's funny. Are you already thinking oh, I'll do that, but then you're resisting it? It's interesting, isn't it? You know, in my book, uh, one of the first chapters before we get into the main lessons of the book, I, I talk about effort. You know, because as much as I want to help people create change in their life, is they're going to put some effort in. And then I do this kind of chapter on effort and learning to love effort and understanding it's going to be a part of your journey. And if you do the work, you will see massive change and all that kind of stuff. And then I do the first chapter, which is the first baby step. And at the end of that baby step, I said, are you already feeling resistance not doing the effort? You know, because because if you if you're not going to do the work, you're not going to get the change. And so, um, fingers crossed. If, if 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 as I what I talked about today, I had a note with you today. Make sure you do the work. Anyway, uh, that's this week's show pretty much done and dusted. The book is out on the fourth of July. If you can help me out in any way, shape, form, be ready for that day and get ready to buy the book, spread the word about the book. And, and do reviews and all the rest of it. Uh, if you want to support the show, go to bevanjamesisles.com, become a patron by going to podcast, support me, go through the process. If you want to email me, you can email me at bevanjames at gmail.com. But after that, that's pretty much just so done and dusted. I might try getting an interview for the next show because I've basically got this show coming up in a couple of weeks from now. And then, and then the one after that will be the book release. Oh, there you go. So I might actually I might actually do a show the day the book gets released just because it's exciting times in my life. And and obviously my book is an exciting time in your life as well. Anyway, that's this week's show done and dusted. Thanks for your time, thanks for your energy, and as always, keep being you. Mm-hmm.